my dear friends. Okay, so we are going to dive into the prophecy of Amos. Amos was an 8th century BC prophet from the southern kingdom and he went up to denounce the northern kingdom, a kingdom we've become quite familiar with with our exploration of Jonah. In some ways the book of Jonah it seems to be a satire caricaturizing the spiritually sick kingdom of the north and its oversight, its lack of understanding of its own idolatries. You see, the northern kingdom was led by a man named Jeroboam II, whom we were introduced to in our last series on Jonah. Let me dive a little bit more into who Jeroboam was and why his leadership in Israel was quite a problem. I'm in a bubble. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. And he reigned 41 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from gath Ephraim. For the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, for there was none left, bond or free, and there was none to help Israel. But the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, so he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. You see, Jeroboam the second was at the helm of of northern kingdom Israel during a time of great prosperity. You could even call them golden years. You see though, it wasn't the golden years for everyone. It was maybe the golden years of prosperity and wealth for those at the top. There was a great deal of injustice happening. And we get a vivid picture of that from the prophecy of Amos. This is from a Bible scholar named Peter Streisdom. I think I'm saying that right. So talking about Jeroboam's kingdom, in this near axiomatic reconstruction, the multiple references in the text suggest a rich upper class and a general economic progress has been coupled with ease to Jeroboam's so-called golden years of great prosperity and peace. Reference to wealth and political stability in foreign affairs is seen as a reflection of the prosperity and grandeur that was introduced by the eminently successful Jeroboam II, but often without due recognition of the concurrent social injustice, perhaps even the seeds of resistance and subversion that is clearly and prominently portrayed in the Amos text. So where did all of this rampant injustice come from? Douglas Stewart in Word Biblical Commentary talks about Jeroboam II. In the final half of his tenure, Israel reached what was probably its height in terms of economic prosperity. Agriculture flourished in spite of occasional crop failures. International peace, in contrast to frequent wars of the previous century, allowed Israel to gain wealth via international trade. Large-scale urbanization followed the new economic order, since those who profit came from trade, and those who benefited from slave labor usury were no longer bound to the land as their former ancestors had been. Those with the means to buy up food in the countryside and resell it to a captive audience in the cities could make enormous profits if they were greedy enough, as many were. Really, when you start to think about it, all problems have their causes in a lack of healthy relationship with God. Excessive wealth led to the creation of a leisured upper class who increasingly adopted a decadent lifestyle. But other forms of unfaithfulness to the covenant were rampant as well, including sexual immorality and idolatry. These were hardly limited to any socioeconomic class. We know that the brokenness in the world is caused by a broken relationship between God and man. We know this from Genesis chapter 3 and so on. Nevertheless, it was the exploitation of the poor and defenseless by the rich and powerful that God particularly exposed through Amos' oracles. Toward the midpoint of the 8th century, Israel enjoyed peace, prosperity, and a measure of international prestige. A confident nation took comfort in its military prowess and ignored its exploitation of the needy and the growing disparity between privilege and poverty. And so where did Northern Kingdom Israel 
come off the rails. Religion, per se, was enthusiastically practiced, but by a people whose fidelity to the covenant was a sham. Where was their brokenness with God? Israel was a people often orthodox in style of worship, but disobedient in personal and social behavior. Well, let's take a look at the development of the northern cult. Was a shame. Was a sham. I can't remember if I, it might be a typo. At the starting of the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, the guy that God gives this kingdom to, Jeroboam the first, lots of Jeroboams, Jeroboam the first, Jeroboam's son of Nebat, he is this new ordained king of the ten tribes. Well, wh what does he do? Well, he doesn't wait for instruction. You know, the temple is in the southern kingdom. The, the temple is in Judah. The temple is in Jerusalem. And instead of waiting on, hey, God, what do you think I should do about how to worship you? He's like, you know what? I've got a great idea. I remember this this, uh, this story that my grandparents used to tell me about building a calf idol. Why don't we do that? And thus, the northern kingdom was plunged into idolatry because of the, I don't know, spiritual oversight, ignorance, bad decision making, hard heart. I don't know what it was. But Jeroboam was like, yeah, let's just set up these calf idols. And he doesn't repent. He just is like, no, this is how we're going to worship God. It's going to be great. He sets up two of these things, and thus the northern kingdom is forged on idolatry. So from the get-go, this nation, you could say, was founded in idolatry. So that's problematic, right? It just perpetuates. It continues generation after generation after generation. You can read the books of Kings. Even though God sends prophets to call out the kings and to ask them back into the relationship they had with God, they, they refuse to tear down the idols upon which their country was founded. So we've become increasingly familiar with the reign of Jeroboam II as we've looked at Jonah and now Amos. And we're going to get a really vivid picture of the brokenness that was happening within the northern kingdom. You see, Jonah seems to represent it, but Amos begins to diagnose it line by line, identifying where Jeroboam II's Israel was out of sync with God. Okay, so who else is involved here? Let's take a look at the spokesman of God to Jeroboam II's Israel, our boy, Amos. Of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn, and the top of Carmel withers. And Amaziah said to Amos, O oh, seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah eat bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy in Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Amos is introduced to us with three different job titles, and I'm going to list them here in Hebrew and tell you what they mean. Nocade. A nocade is a shepherd of sheep. Simple enough. He's also called a bokeh, which is a herdsman of cattle. He's also called a boles, a picker of sycamore figs. Let me read a little bit about how these jobs may have connected. The way Douglas Stewart sees it, a biblical commentator, these are all connected. Let me kind of paraphrase what his argument is. Amos is an agricultural consultant traveling in agribusiness whose business might have taken him north toward the sycamore figs and herds of Bashan cattle in the Jordan Valley. So you have this guy. He's an agricultural specialist, right? He, he, he does something with sycamore figs. And I've actually, well, I got way too interested in the whole sycamore fig thing. So let me just briefly show you what I found about that. Here's maybe one of the jobs that he did or excelled at. This here is a sycamore fig. You see, to get the fruit to ripen up, a dresser of sycamore figs would take one of these little hooks or knives 
and it would cut a hole and it would somehow accelerate the ripening process. So this orchardist, this guy who could help people grow fruit well, is seeing the fruit, if you will, of a brokenness with God on a national scale. You know, it's, and, and considering this, he, he may have been a traveling agricultural consultant. Amos's agricultural business took him north to the Jordan Valley. This is the Erdman's Dictionary. Decomposed volcanics made the soil of the northern Bashan extremely fertile for both natural flora and agriculture. Thus, in biblical times, the region was famous for its cattle, timber, and agriculture. All that agriculture in Bashan made for some interesting encounters with Amos. In his dealings with the north, he was exposed over and over again to the brokenness of this kingdom, and he comes to denounce it. So as someone who is attentive to the ecosystem of agriculture, it comes as no surprise that his opening words, as he comes in spitting bars at Northern Kingdom Israel, that he sees a picture of ecological disaster. You see, the covenant context of Deuteronomy and the Sinaitic Covenant give God a framework of judgment that they entered into covenant relationship and if Israel disobeyed, there were some vivid things that would happen as a result of their disobedience. They went into the covenant knowing that. And might I add, I will say that even in the, the curse section of the covenant, there's blessings and there's curses, even in the curse section, there is promised restoration. So I just want to say that, that the story of redemption, the, you could say the narrative of Christ's love, is built into the Sinaitic covenant from the beginning. So don't worry too much. But at this moment, they are out of sync with God and God is calling them on it. And he's saying, here's what's going to happen as a result of it. So let's take a look at the central figure of biblical prophecy, Yahweh, the God of Israel. So guys, as you can see, God is confronting Israel with its covenant disobedience. Here, you have the imagery of God roaring like a lion. This is what you could call a theophany. Theophanies happen throughout the Old Testament, and a lot of them are related to God's appearance at Sinai, where he comes and he wraps himself in this thunderous mountain of fire. And so you have this sense that God is coming in judgment over Israel, looming like a storm, not one that would bring rain and refreshment, but one that would in fact dry up the very Mount Carmel, the, the crown jewel of all of Northern Kingdom Israel, and its ecosystem would be withered away. This is from an 1897 Bible dictionary called Eastman's, but I think you'll find it interesting. He says, no mountain in or around Palestine retains its ancient beauty so much as Carmel. Two or three villages and some scattered cottages are found on it. Its groves are few but luxuriant. It is no place for crags and precipices or rocks of wild goats, but its surface is covered with a rich and constant verdure. The whole mountainside is dressed with blossom and flowering shrubs and fragrant herbs. The western extremity of the ridge is However, more rocky and bleak than the eastern. The head of the bride in uh, Canticle 7.5 is compared to Carmel. It is ranked with Bashan on account of its rich pastures. The whole ridge is deeply furrowed with rocky ravines filled with dense jungle. 
So for this place to dry up would be shocking. We have learned from our friend Jonah and his experience with God and the Ninevites that God's confrontation is for the sake of of the redemption of a relationship between him and the people he confronts. So rest assured as we explore Amos and his his word, his denouncement of Israel and the, the injustices he sees, know that this is one of the main roles of biblical prophecy. Not simply the prediction of the future, nor is it simply the pronouncement of oracles of judgment, but the role of biblical prophecy is for the redemption of a relationship. That the relationship between Israel is broken. That they are no longer reflecting their unique call to live out in representative status of God. They are advocating for a broken way of life and perpetuating a brokenness and they seem blissfully unaware of it. They seem like they're in right relationship with God as we're going to trace through this this prophecy. You'll see that Israel doesn't seem to be concerned about the injustice that it perpetuates. And God is saying, "You're, you're out of sync with me. You need to return. You need to be broken. You need to lament and you need to 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 become restored in the relationship you have with me. God is pleading Israel to return. As we read this prophecy, remember that this is one of the roles of biblical prophecy. And we can take this upon ourselves as well. That what God attempts to do through his word is corrective. That it's not simply condemnation or simply counting all the things wrong with society. But it's to look at it and to be broken by it. That is the occasion of restoration, of redemption, right? We know this through Christ, right? That we come broken. We come just as we are. And that's where God meets us. But he meets us in repentance. And so just as the Ninevites repented when they realized how out of sync they were with even this God that claimed to be the God of the cosmos that was not part of their pantheon, may we even more realize that the the intimate relationship we have with God through Jesus, that amazing and beautiful God, is looking at these injustices as an infraction of the relationship between Him and His people. So may we sit in that, that when we hear these things and when we hear the denouncement of injustice, May we realize that what God seeks is the restoration of relationship between him and his people. And when that happens, we can truly represent him and we can live in a society that is just and righteous and reflecting of the very kingdom of heaven. That's what prophecy is all about. Casting a vision for what God is going to do with when his covenant people are restored in relationship with him. So as we join this journey and as we hear the indictment and the pain and the diagnosis of a broken culture, may we listen to this shepherd, herdsman, orchardist. And may we hear how he wants to point out these things for the sake of our relationship with God. Don't you want to be close to God? Don't you want to know if you're out of sync with Him? Don't you want to know what pleases God's heart? Let us find out what concerns the very heart of God as we explore the prophet of Amos. Godspeed. I'll see you guys Wednesday.